And now I've rebooted into the system that we installed in part one of the installation video. The second part of the video is concerned with configuring your newly installed system. And the second part of the installation starts with setting a password for the system's root user. This is the system's administrative account. You should choose a password here and confirm it by entering it twice. If you use special characters in your admin password, you can test the keyboard layout is correct by typing in the third field towards the bottom of the screen. If your password is too simple or too short, a pop-up will warn you that you're creating an insecure password. A good choice of password would be a mix of upper and lowercase characters mixed with numbers and with more than five characters. In the expert options for the root password, you can change the algorithm which is used to encrypt the password on the disk, but this change is usually not necessary. Now you can set the host name and the domain name of the system. These are the network names of the computer. The default selection gives you a random name. However, you can set it to obtain a new name using the DHCP protocol. In this example, we're going to call the computer Demo. If you're not part of a network, you don't usually have to change the domain name, so just leave it as is. On the network configuration screen, you've now got several options to configure the system's networking. As with all the screens in the installation, if you're not sure what to do, the defaults are probably good enough. So in this example, we're just going to press Next. You can always come back and reconfigure the network after the installation is completed. Next you can test the internet connection of the system. If you've configured the network yourself or if you've just taken the defaults you can run this test here which starts the network card and downloads the release notes in order to uh, show you anything that changed since the uh, CD or the DVD was, was created. It also runs an online update immediately to get any updated packages. The system now downloads the latest release notes and as you see here, it was successful. The next screen gives you the options to configure the online update system. This keeps your system up to date with the latest security and bug fixes. You can choose here if you want to send some hardware information to Novell. This helps us to see what kind of hardware is being used. If you want to see exactly what will be sent, press details. If you don't want to send this information, you can always turn it off. In this case, we're just going to press Next. And now, an online update server is located on the internet and is added to the configuration. Depending how long OpenSUSE 10.3 has been available when you install the system, there could be quite a number of updates. To speed this video up, we're going to skip the updates. Now you select the authentication method. If you're not part of a networked authentication system, or if you don't know what these options mean, please take the default option, which is local. Having chosen local authentication, you now get to create your local user. Type in the user's full name, a username for that user. You can click the suggestion button to do this if you like. And type in a password, choosing it twice. If you select the automatic logon button, this user will be automatically logged on as soon as the system boots. If you don't do this, a user selector will appear. If you want to add more users, or to change the user options, you can click on User Management. But we're just going to add the one user right now.
At this point, a program called SUSE Config runs. This is where all the system settings that you made earlier are written to disk. As it's running the first time, it can take some time, especially if you don't have very much memory in the system. Just be patient. Once SUSE Config is completed, you're shown the release notes downloaded during the internet text. You can read them again, but in this case, we're going to just skip them. Now at this point you may see the console for a short time. This is just part of the system setting up its, uh, its tests to configure the graphical system. It's nothing unusual. The final screen of the configuration part shows you the co settings for all of the system's hardware. The most interesting thing here is the graphical configuration. Sensible defaults are usually chosen by the system, which gives you the best resolution that your graphics card and monitor can do. If you want to change this, you can click on the underlined options here. You can also make any changes that you need to to the graphical or other hardware configurations after the system is installed and the configuration is completed. So you don't have to do anything now. We press next. Finally, the hardware configuration settings are saved. The last screen of the installation just tells you that the installation completed successfully. Just press finish and we'll start the system. The system will switch back to the text console one more time as the graphics server starts. When you log into the desktop the first time, all the settings have to be created. This takes some time on the first run. On the next run, it will be much quicker. I hope you've enjoyed watching the OpenSUSE 10.3 installation video. If you have any questions, look on OpenSUSE.org. There's an awful lot of information in the wiki, or on the mailing lists, or on the OpenSUSE IRC channel.